Hi, everyone. Welcome to our climate change event. Thinking, um, oops, I'm already messing up the title because I'm a little nervous. <laughs> but welcome, everyone. My name is Andrea. I'm a program coordinator at Dia Chuchas, and I'm very excited to be here today and with a, a lot of um, important community members that have been doing a lot of work in on climate change. Um, so welcome to Thinking Globally and Acting Locally. Um, so today we are very honored to have Congressman Tony Cardenas with here. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to give you a little short introduction and then he's going to speak. Um, so Representative Cardenas has been, uh, was first elected to the United States House of Representatives in 2013 for the um, 113th Congress and has represented uh, California's 29th district since. Now in the 116th Congress, Representative Cardenas sits on the prestigious House Committee on Energy and Commerce, which he was elected in his first term. The Committee on Energy and Commerce is the oldest of the authorizing committees in the House. So Representative Cardenas is committed to bringing awareness and change to issues most important in the San Fernando Valley and its families. A passionate advocate for justice, Cardenas' work on common sense, gun safety, immigration reform, and juvenile justice has been recognized and praised both locally and nationally. Born in Pacoima, uh, Representative Cardenas still resides in the San Fernando Valley with his family, and he's served more than 20 years in public office, um, and he's made history as the first Latino elected to represent the San Fernando Valley in the United States Congress. And he continues um, this passionate work here um, for our community in Washington. So um, with that introduction, I give you Representative Tony Cardenas. Thank you, Andrea. I really appreciate this opportunity to be with all of you to talk about a lot of important issues. But today, uh, more importantly, we're talking about um, the climate and uh, what is or isn't happening and what we should be doing as human beings to make sure that we turn it around and uh, improve upon our environment rather than continuing to, to uh, damage it as we've had over the centuries. Um, as you mentioned, Andrea, I was born and raised here in the San Fernando Valley. I'm very proud of that, but equally proud of having immigrant parents. I grew up in an immigrant household and uh, people think I'm joking when I say, you know, Latinos are natural born recyclers. We are like the, the folks who recycle, not only out of necessity, but out of uh, knowing that that is the right thing to do. Many of us uh, are connected and believe strongly in our indigenous roots. And when you look at the circular um, reality of truth, the fact of the matter is, um, I think that our people, Latino people have always been good stewards of the earth and good stewards of our community and good stewards uh, within our family, in our community, and beyond. When you look at the kind of uh, history that we have just here in the United States alone, many of us um, are either immigrants or raised by immigrants like myself, and people think very derogatory of us. But when you really look at us for who we are, we're very loving, caring uh, people, not only for our families, but for our communities as well. And um, this pandemic, for example, just approved once again that Latinos always step up. We always step up and make sure that we're on the front lines. We make sure that we're there when people need to eat, we're there for them. We're there when people need healthcare, we're there for them. When we have to put ourselves at risk, we're there for them. Those are the kinds of things that I'm very, very proud of as being not only a Latino, but actually somebody who's been fortunate and blessed to be raised in the United States. My parents were raised in Mexico. They only went to the first and second grade. So when they came here, their dream was to see their children get a basic education. We we're talking about just high school, but we're very blessed that here in the San Fernando Valley, my brothers and sisters went far, far beyond high school to get bachelor's, master's degrees, teachers, engineers, psychologists amongst us. And uh, some of you, I don't know if all of you here know, but um, some of the founders of uh, the Achuchas are actually my family members. Uh, somebody who I look up to, somebody who used to help me with my mathematics, and I became an engineer, is my sister Trini. Uh, she used to help me with my homework. Uh, yet at the same time, because of the biases in our community, and with all due respect, some of the ignorance, my sister Trini was not allowed to go away to college. Um, she got a full ride scholarship to go to Stanford. She didn't go because her immigrant parents didn't realize that there's a big difference between Stanford or Valley College 
or uh, Cal State U University Northridge. They're all great organizations, but the bottom line is when you're raised by parents who have old school ideals, who only went to the first and second grade, sometimes it takes us to give that extra effort to educate them and to get them to realize that their child, their daughter going to Stanford is in fact the reason why they came here. But sometimes it's not obvious. Why do I tell you that story? Because it's a true story and it's unfortunate. Uh, even though I love my parents dearly uh, and they did an amazing job raising 11 of us children right here in Pacoima, um, sometimes ignorance can be very, very damaging. And that's what I think is going on when it comes to our environment. Too many people are walking around, driving around, going about their daily lives, not realizing that every single one of us contributes to global warming. Every single one of us contributes more than we should to damaging our environment, but we can do better. We must do better. And I've been elected as an elected official, and I'm very proud to say that I'll give you some examples. Uh, when I became a United States uh, Congressman, I worked my tail off to make sure that more humble people get, get to Washington. And I did everything that I could to make sure that when Kamala Harris became our vice president, somebody was gonna get appointed to be the United States Senator for California. And I worked my tail off talking to the governor, working with um, the, the president, working with my colleagues, Hispanic and non-Hispanic colleagues, Latino and non-Latino colleagues, to make sure that people understand that in a state like California, with about 40% of the population is Latino, why is it that we've never had a Latino U.S. Senator? And lo and behold, Alex Padilla, born and raised in Pacoima, the son of immigrants, actually got the appointment from Governor Newsom to be our United States Senator. That's something we should be very proud of. So what's one of the first things that Alex Padilla, who grew up in Pacoima, and Tony Cardenas, who grew up in Pacoima, what we did is we introduced a bill to ask and to demand that we get $25 billion to electrify 500,000 school buses across the United States. That's right, 500,000 school buses. That's approximately the number of school buses in the United States that are powered by diesel. These school buses are negatively affecting not only the drivers, but all of those dozens of children every single day, just taking in that particulate matter that is damaging their lives, robbing them of their future. So Alex Padilla, two sons of immigrants, kids from Pacoima, we introduced the bill, him in the Senate and me in the House of Representatives. Also, when Alex Padilla and Tony Cardenas, when we were on the city council of Los Angeles, representing two of the council districts here in the San Fernando Valley, when he asked me what um, chairmanship I wanted, I said, I wanna be the chairman that oversees the airport, the ports and the um, Department of Water and Power. People don't know this, but the Department of Water and Power is the biggest municipal water district in the country, water and power district in the country. That's right, our water and power. But guess what? When I got elected to the city council and Alex and I were partners on the city council, they were taking in 60% of the electricity that they produced was coming from coal plants. So Alex said, as the chairman of that committee, we need to change things. And I said, yes, we will, and we are. So Alex Badia and I forced the Department of Water and Power to create a renewable uh, portfolio standard. That's a fancy way of saying that they would actually put in ink and actually document and vote on it at the board of the Department of Water and Power that they were gonna start powering down all of their um, uh, fossil fuel facilities and move to green energy. And that's what they've been doing since we got there. Yes, two Latinos from Pacoima made that happen. Also, when I got on the city council, I was the first council member in the Northeast San Fernando Valley where there's over 30 dump sites in the Northeast Valley. We were literally the dumping grounds for generations for Los Angeles. I was the first councilman to actually tell a company that owned a dump site that they will not get an extension on that facility. It had, no one had ever been told no to an extension on a dump site. You may know that dump site, those of you who grew up in the Northeast Valley, as the Bradley Landfill. The Bradley Landfill, when it was first permitted, had a permit to go at grade. Then they got an extension and another one and another one. They actually got extensions to go 100 feet above, uh, above grade. 
And when I became the councilman, they came to me like they did to all the other previous council members. And they said, we want an extension. And I said, no. And they threatened me because those were union jobs. And I still said no. And then the union threatened me because they said, we're going to lose our union jobs. And I said, no, you're not. I'm going to work with this company to make sure that they want to take in trash. They're going to create a MRF station. Instead of putting the trash in the ground like cavemen did, we're going to make sure that you actually sort that and actually recycle it and put it where it belongs so that you minimize the impact on the environment. And sure enough, we agreed and they did. They made the cleanest MRF. And for those of you who are really involved in environmental issues, it was actually a negative air pressure MRF, the first one in Los Angeles, which means that none of that, none of that would escape into the environment. They would all go through filters. So those are just some examples of what I've been doing. Yes, this son of immigrants. Yes, this person that the LA Times wrote an article when I ran for office in 1996 and Alex Padilla ran my campaign. He was only 22 years old. The LA Times wrote an article saying that I was going to lose the race and that I was gonna come in third place and that we were not gonna get the first Latino to represent us in the San Fernando Valley in the state legislature. I became a state assemblyman in 1996 because the community believed in me, because I made commitments and promises that if I get elected, I'm gonna do things differently. And that's where we've been and that's where we're at. And I'm very proud of the work that I've been doing. And that doesn't even speak to the work that I've been doing in Washington. I gave you one example about our clean, um, clean bus campaign, our electric bus campaign that Alex and I are doing, but there's many more. But I know that there's a lot more things you wanna talk about today. And I'm gonna to try to stick around for the whole hour plus to try to see if, uh, if you have any questions for me. So once again, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. And thank you so much for that introduction, Andrea, and uh, back to you. Thank you again for joining us. And I can't stress how important it is to have folks like, uh, for to have leaders of color be here and showing up for their community in, in this position that you're in. Thank you for all your work. And, and we look forward to to see how our community evolves in a positive way. And this is one of the first steps to getting informed. And I myself as well, born in Somar, raised in Somar, I'm very excited to learn more today. So I'm gonna pass it to Tim Knipp and David Gaines. Um, they have a really great presentation and I'll let them introduce themselves to you. David, you wanna kick it off? Hi there. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is David Gaines and I want to thank you all for giving us this time in your busy lives um, to discuss the urgency of our climate crisis and what we can all do about it. And I want to thank uh, Congressman Cardenas for all he's uh, doing. And I apologize for my terrible um, Latin uh, accent. Um, before I'm beginning though, I do want to mention that I met my colleague for the tonight's discussion, Tim Knight. When we were sitting next to each other at a table taking Al Gore's climate reality leadership training a few years ago. And even though we only live a few blocks away from each other, we'd actually never met. So before I do anything else, I just want to thank Al Gore's climate reality project for linking me up with Tim and uh, other climate activists. You know, there's actually an awful lot of us um, in the world and we need to be linked and we have to start working together. As far as I and my background, um, I was born and raised in the valley as well, beautiful downtown Burbank, for those of you old enough to remember the phrase. <clears throat> Back in the before times, before the pandemic, I had just retired from the film industry, where I had spent the last 40 years working as a film editor and a post producer. So I had spent most of my life sequestered away um, in a dark editing room with very limited human contact. You know, I mention this because reaching out and speaking to a group of more than four or five people is a task that I uh, frankly find very challenging. And even through the Zoom technology, where I'm not actually standing up in front of you, I'm still way outside my comfort zone. I'm doing this to stretch myself and also to lead by example, because the climate crisis means that soon, very soon, we may all be existing outside of our own personal comfort zones. In fact, we may be trying to exist outside of humanity's comfort zone. This past year of the pandemic, and in fact, the past uh, four years of uh, Agent Orange's presidency has given us all a taste of what living outside our comfort zone feels like. 
and we've thought of it as temporary. But if we continue uh, spewing carbon and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at current rates, we might be revising our collective memories this period because it won't be temporary. I think of George W. Bush's presidency uh, as a progressive Democrat. It seemed really terrible to me at the time. But after four years of age in Orange, well, it doesn't seem so bad. Anyway, enough about me. Let's get on with this. This image you've been looking at is known as Earthrise. It was snapped by the uh, astronaut. <laughs> what? We're not seeing an image yet, David. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was up. No, hang on. So this image that you are now looking at, which I thought you'd been looking at, oh, um, is, um, is uh, called Earthrise. And it was shot by Bill Anders on the Apollo uh, mission that preceded the moon landing. They were looking for a um, lunar landing sites. And this image really rocked our world because we saw our planet out in you know, this blue orb sitting out in the vast emptiness of space. And we really had to think about the whole of our of our planet as a you know as this unique um, entity in the vastness of space. And I can't speak as eloquently about it as Amanda Gorman will. And Tim is going to play a little piece she's written called uh, Earthrise. And then well, let me apologize for the technical glitches. <laughs> On Christmas Eve, 1968, astronaut Bill Anders snapped a photo of the Earth as Apollo 8 orbited the moon. Those three guys were surprised to see from their eyes a planet looked like an Earth rise, a blue orb hovering over the moon's gray horizon with deep oceans and silver skies. It was our world's first glance at itself, our first chance to see a shared reality, a declared stance, and a commonality, a glimpse into our planet's mirror. And as threats drew nearer, our own urgency became clearer as we realized that we hold nothing dearer than this floating body we all call home. We've known that we're caught in the throes of climactic changes some say will just go away while some simply pray to survive another day. For it is the obscure, the oppressed, the poor who when the disaster is declared done still suffer more than anyone. Climate change is the single greatest challenge of our time. Of this, you're certainly aware. It's saddening, but I cannot spare you from knowing an inconvenient fact because it's getting the facts straight that gets us to act and not to wait. So I tell you this not to scare you, but to prepare you, to dare you to dream a different reality where despite disparities, we all care to protect this world, this riddled blue marvel, this little true marvel to master the verve in the nerve to see how we can serve our planet. You don't need to be a politician to make it your mission to conserve, to protect, to preserve that one and only home that is ours to use your unique power to give next generations the planet they deserve. We are demonstrating, creating, advocating. We heed this inconvenient truth because we need to be anything but lenient with the future of our youth. And while this is a training and sustaining the future of our planet, there is no rehearsal. The time is now, 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 because the reversal of harm and protection of a future so universal should be anything but controversial. So, Earth, pale blue dots, we will fail you not just as we chose to go to the moon. We know it's never too soon to choose hope. We choose to do more than cope with climate change. We choose to end it. We refuse to lose. We do this and more, not because it's very easy or nice, but because it is necessary. 
because with every dawn we carry the weights of the fates of this celestial body orbiting a star and as heavy as the weight sounded it doesn't hold us down but it keeps us grounded steady ready because an environmental movement of this size is simply another form of an earth rise to see it close your eyes visualize that all of us in this room and outside of these walls or in these halls all of us change makers or in a spacecraft floating like a silver raft in space and we see the face of a planet anew we relish the view we witness it's round green and brilliant blue which inspires us to ask deeply wholly what can we do open your eyes know the future of this wise planet is right in sight right in all of us trust this earth uprising all of us bring light to exciting solutions never tried before for it is our hope that implores us at our uncompromising core to keep rising up for an earth more than worth fighting for So, uh, my apologies to to David, my colleague, for screwing up the technical uh, aspects of his introduction. My apologies. Amanda Gorman is a hard act to follow. Um, my name is Tim Knipe, and as David mentioned, we were trained by Al Gore's Climate Reality Project to present information about our looming climate crisis. But before that, I was a high school teacher. I began my teaching career at Silmar High School. As a new teacher, I was desperate for resources, but I soon found Tia Chuchas. It provided an invaluable support system for my students as well as for myself, one I will always be grateful for. In fact, when a few other colleagues and I decided to start a new high school, Luis Rodriguez gave of his time and energy to help us make it a reality. I believe that our Social Justice Humanitas Academy would have been a much longer shot without his help and the help of his wife, Trini. They were always there. So it's a great honor to be hosted by this special place tonight. I just wanna say thank you for everything, both Trini and Luis and his staff and Andrea. Thank you. So, uh, really quick, if I could just ask, um, are you sharing something right now? Not yet, not yet. Okay, great. Just making sure. Should be dark. Thank you. So back to, so back to the topic at hand. Do you recognize this photo? Um, and usually, when I would show this to my high school students, I would get crickets. Who is this guy? Nobody knows. It all depends on oh. when you went to high school. <laughs> so I hear it. somebody recognizes. I don't recognize him. No. I went to high school a long, long, long time ago. He's a French guy. Go ahead. <laughs> That's right. 100%. Um, anyway, I spent a good portion of the 70s and 80s working with Jacques Cousteau as a writer and a spokesperson. Um, well, he began as a pioneer in the world of ocean exploration. He also invented much of the technology that's still used today by divers and underwater filmmakers. Working with him taught me a lot about how the systems on this planet work, and most of all, how interdependent they all are. So my earliest introduction to the environment was through the lens of the sea, which is actually perfect because as you can see from this photo, the planet is blue. And that blue covers nearly three quarters of the Earth's surface. This is the first picture of the Earth fully illuminated that any of us ever saw. It was taken on the last of the Apollo missions and it changed the way that humanity thought about our common home. And not only did we see just how pervasive the ocean across our, is across our planet, we saw for the first time graphically our atmosphere in the form of clouds. When we look up at the sky, we tend to feel that it's a vast cushion that separates us from dark, cold, and limitless expanse of space. But in actual fact, it's a very thin membrane, just a shell between us in the darkness of space. If the earth was the size of an apple, the atmosphere would be 1 20th the thickness of the skin on that apple. Take a look at how 
thin an apple skin is and imagine one twentieth of that. So I wanna kick this off <clears throat> with a little quick science overview on what the greenhouse effect is and why it's a problem, why, why it's happening. Um, just, I know everybody has ideas. Some have uh, complete knowledge, some just little bits here and there. So if we all start on the same, from the same place, I think it would be helpful. So the greenhouse effect, solar radiation in the form of light waves passes through the atmosphere and that atmosphere is defined in this image with that, by that narrow blue line around the earth. Most of this radiation is absorbed by the earth and warms it. But some energy is radiated back into space by the, the uh, earth in the form of infrared waves. Now the atmosphere is the right composition to allow only certain amount of that heat to escape while keeping the rest of it on the planet to keep us at a habitable temperature. And it's been working beautifully for eons. <laughs> but watch that, that atmospheric layer. See it thicken? As the CO2 concentration increases, more of that outgoing infrared radiation is trapped and our planet starts to heat up. And that's precisely what we're encountering today. <clears throat> we're spewing 152 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into that thin shell of our atmosphere every day. We treat it as a sewer. And it comes from many different sources, um, agriculture, forest burning, obviously, but landfills, things we wouldn't think about. Um, and it's happening every day, continuously. The largest source, of course, is our dependence on fossil fuels. Um, all of this is just fossil fuel CO2 going into the sky. You can see that after World War II, it started really shooting up. <clears throat> now this thermometer, is showing us how the rate of carbon in the atmosphere relates to rising average temperatures on our planet. It shows us just how close we are to reaching that saturation point. I want you to keep be aware of that number, 450 parts per million. The parts per million of CO2 in our atmosphere is key. If we hit that threshold of 450 parts per million, we're gonna be looking at a two degrees Celsius rise in our mean temperature we are going to start losing things. The, our society is going to change dramatically. If we continue to go up that scale, allowing more CO2, we're gonna be losing water shortages, species. Eventually at 650 parts per million, we probably have a four degree Celsius rise and we'll lose entire cities to sea level rise. Right now we're hovering around 415, 417 parts per million. <clears throat> Excuse me. 19 of the 20, hot, 20 hottest years on record have occurred since 2001. The last five years have been the hottest. Now I wanna take a little quick look at the climate system. If you look at the overall uh, climate system, it's an engine for distributing heat towards the poles. It does that through the ocean currents and air currents, wind currents that circulate around the planet. The result is if you have a rise of one degree centigrade at the equator, that will be magnified three times at the poles. And what's happening is we're seeing now intense heat in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, but we get more news about the Arctic. And it, that disrupts those ocean currents, disrupts the, the uh, weather patterns. Now we've seen huge blizzards in Texas. Um, we've seen extreme heats in the Arctic and in the Northeast, in the Southwest. In fact, at the, in February of 2018, the North Pole was 50 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than normal. What happens? <clears throat> we lose the ice, the ice melts. The ice is a reflective surface that helps us by reflecting heat back into the atmosphere. We lose, as the, the planet warms up, we lose that ice layer and it, what it reveals is an absorbing layer of ocean that actually does the opposite. It absorbs the heat and adds to the heating up of the whole, of the whole planet. So in addition, to, in addition to ice loss, which is le leading to sea level rise, we're also losing it as a reflective layer. 
the temperature rises, more ice melts. The greenhouse gas emissions increase and the planet warming accelerates. Global mean sea level rise is happening 25% faster than in the late 20th century with serious consequences. For example, we have octopus looking for a parking space in Miami Beach. This is not because of rain. This is a high tide day in Miami Beach, Florida. And <clears throat> this happens normally. This is a normal pattern. Many people think that the recent disaster we've seen has something to do with climate change. The fact is the chlorides in salt water, which is in the salt air, has uh, rusts the rebar, which leads to a cracking of the concrete. Still speculation, but it could be a factor. For every <clears throat> one degree Fahrenheit that the atmosphere warms, it can hold about 4% more water vapor. The warmer ocean temperatures are like fuel for tropical storms. They pick up much more energy and moisture. As a result, we have longer hurricane seasons and such catastrophic storms as Katrina, Harvey, and Sandy, to name a few. And that same extra heat that's disrupting the water cycle by putting that moisture in the air and causing downpours and hurricanes is also pulling the moisture out of the soil and making the droughts deeper and longer and happening throughout the world. Here's the Amadan Reservoir in January, the rainy season. <clears throat> the extreme heat coupled with drought conditions led to a longer and more destructive wildfire season and continues to do that. This graph shows us the correlation between the higher than average spring and summer temperatures with the, much, uh, with the number of, of large scale fires that have occurred with greater frequency over the last 40 years. So last summer in California, the hundreds of wildfires we experienced put more carbon into the atmosphere than all the reductions our state's carbon mitigation efforts have removed. Climate change is now the primary driver of forest dryness. This is extending the fire season in the Western US and doubling the area that would have burned naturally since 1984. Just in October of 2020, in that one month, there were five major fires in the LA area alone. And there are some less obvious dangers emerging from uh, with a warming climate. Now, towards the end of June, north of the Arctic Circle in Siberia, it went over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Siberia, probably the hottest temperature north of the Arctic Circle. This is leading also to the melting of the permafrost, which is a huge repository of methane. As it melts, it's releasing that methane into the atmosphere. Now, think about this. A ton of methane warms the planet 34 times more than a ton of CO2. And we're releasing that by allowing the permafrost to melt. The climate crisis is finally being recognized as a national security issue. The US Defense Department has for many years warned us about food and water shortages, pandemic disease, and the refugee flows caused by the climate crisis. We saw this happen after the drought in Syria and other factors that led to the the uh, drought and other factors led to a migration of refugees. We're seeing it on our southern border right now as people lose their land where they've been raising crops, they can no longer feed themselves. They're desperate and they have to leave. Cities can't take them, can't support them, and they are forced to, to flee, flee the country. And this is exacerbating our refugee problem. Another danger posed by climate, climate change is, is to our physical health. The impact of the higher temperatures on our health is harsh. This past Tuesday, the temperature in Vancouver, Canada hit 121 degrees. This is yesterday. Dozens are dying. This is Vancouver, Canada. More than 230 deaths have been reported in British Columbia since Friday. It never gets that hot in Canada, ever. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> in addition to heat stress, the tropical diseases are moving north. Airline travel has a lot to do with this, but the climate conditions are changing and changing where these diseases can take root and become endemic. Another really important point that was made by Pope Francis 
and others is that these events have the biggest impact on people with the least resources and communities of color. These are the same communities hit in here in the United States as well. Federal data tracking emergency room visits and hospitalizations in Arizona and Florida reveal higher rates of heat related illnesses in zip codes where there is less income. If you look at the Native Americans in New Mexico where the Navajo Nation has so many members, the death rate from COVID-19 is seven times higher than the death rate from other groups. And nearby in Arizona, it's more than five times higher. This is not new. Of all the, <clears throat> Martin Luther King was making the point back in 1966. You took, if you look at the 10 US counties most vulnerable to flooding and other disasters, they fall 81% on minority populations. The cost of the climate crisis is soaring and it, it continues to soar until we are, until we abate it. This graph shows since 2010, or it shows the, the rise in events and cost since 1980. The insurance companies are certainly paying heed because this is how they are tracking the disasters. This is their chart. We, <clears throat> and to continue the economic focus uh, for a moment, consider the impact of the carbon budget. To keep, the global, to, to keep global climate from warming above two degrees, this much of our known identified res reserves need to remain in the ground. 62% of identified fossil fuels, 88% of coal needs to remain in the ground. The problem is that these reserves are already valued on the books of these multinational companies and sovereign nations that are owners. The value of these untouchable carbon reserves is estimated to be around $22 trillion. That translates to $22 trillion of loss to these companies, which is, and that's already negatively affecting their share, share values. You can see if you separate out the values of their shares compared to the rest of the uh, S&P, you'll see they're taking a nosedive. And this brings us to the impending paradigm shift in our economy. And while we move away from one technology, we're expanding others. As a result, we're shifting jobs, not ending them. One door closes, another door opens. <clears throat> and this paradigm shift is massive. The new technologies are vast, from geothermal and solar to wind and even nuclear. We only have time here to scratch the surface. But in the US over the last five years, solar jobs have grown six times faster than average job growth in the United States. There are already nearly five times as many jobs in solar as in coal mining. <clears throat> we don't need more coal jobs. We need to adopt renewable carbon-free technology quickly. The second fast grow fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. This is where the new employment opportunities are coming. And these are the industries we need to support. Let's take, take a look at the past and what we were projecting. Back in 2000, we were projecting that wind capacity would reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. That was like optimistic. The reality by 2019, that goal was exceeded by a factor of 22. And solar. Now solar, there's enough solar energy reaching the earth every hour to fill our needs for an entire year. Think about that, this blew my mind. Every hour we get enough energy from the sun for all of our needs all over the world for a whole year. It's free, it's clean, it's safe. Let's see how we've been doing projections compared to reality in the solar market. Back in 2002, we projected a solar market that, to grow one gigawatt per year by 2010. The reality, it was blown away seven, by 17 times. And it continues. By 2019, it was exceeded by 121 times. And this is largely because we've gone from a beta 
uh, model for solar cells in back in 76, where it cost $79 a watt, down to 2020, where it's reduced to 20 cents a watt because we've come up with production models. We've gone from prototype to production, just like cell phones, just like uh, personal computers. And the key thing, of course, is the storage capacity. That needs to grow. And right now, these are future projections. They're projecting it as a trillion dollar industry, but that is contingent on, or the growth of our renewable sector is contingent on our storage capacity. Auto manufacturers are moving to electric vehicles at a rapid rate. All of these companies have electric vehicles in production. I don't know, most of you probably saw the new F-150 that Ford is releasing that's all electric. It was phenomenal. Towing, the thing was towing a freight train and it's all electric. The fleet of hybrids and electric cars uh, is, is exponentially rising. <clears throat> Over tw 240 global companies now have made a commitment to go 100% renewable. These are some of their logos. You probably recognize some of your favorites right here. And we have a new administration and President Biden is taking the climate seriously. This challenge he takes very seriously. And he's done a lot right at the beginning to over to, to reverse a lot of the trends that the former administration put into action um, and some of the negative uh, uh, impacts that those have caused on our environment. Among those executive actions, he's elevated climate change to an element of foreign US foreign policy and given it a seat on the National Security Council. He's established a White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. For first time, environmental justice will have a seat at the table where the decisions are being made. He set a zero emissions reduction target for 2050. And he put a pause on all new oil and natural gas leases on public lands and offshore waters. Although that is now being held up by a judge in California. Uh, he rejoined the Paris Climate Accord he canceled the Keystone XL pipeline, and he established the Civilian Climate Corps, which is a key part of the um, infrastructure legislation that is now being debated. And he's directed the Secretary of Agriculture to look into climate smart agricultural practices. Very key. And with that, thank you very much. I am going to turn you over to my colleague, David Gaines, hopefully he's still speaking to me. And he's going to tell you a little more about policy solutions and some specific uh, solutions being recommended by CCL. Take it away, David. Thank you, Tim. Um, just want to confirm you're seeing my screen. Yes. OK, great. So as Tim mentioned, the president really is doing the right thing. But the big problem we face is that our fossil fuel companies, um, these multinational corporate giants, well, they've welded way too much power in what we like to think of as our democracy for too long. And they don't play nice. They've been using their money and power to buy politicians, obscure facts, distort the truth. And for the last 40 years, they've been denying the science of climate crisis. Their messaging has really had four goals. They want to confuse and create doubt and division among the groups working on solutions. They want to create the fear that climate action will hurt us, destroy our jobs, take away our freedoms. They want to make people think we need fossil fuels indefinitely. We do need them right now, but as Tim stated, the alternatives do exist. You know, there's a reason that Al Gore named his group the Climate Reality Project. Tim and I are here speaking to you today because the science tells us that climate change is a big deal right now. And it's only going to get worse if we don't act and act quickly. It's like a tsunami or a tidal wave heading our way. But if we wait too long to see it before we act, it'll be too late to get out of the way. You know, the fossil fuel corporations are going to continue to claim climate change isn't that big of a deal until all the glaciers have melted and all the forests have burned. I mean, why should it have to spoil a good golf game? Okay, seriously, it's time to talk about the reality of this crisis to those of us who don't belong to those exclusive country clubs. You know, I shared that last picture just to help us remember that this crisis is seriously impacting most of us right now 
and being mostly ignored by those few who benefit the most from the exploitation of our environment and our climate. Which helps us on to this next point, the economic and environmental justice issues. These are two related but really distinct concepts. What we need right now is legislation to deliver actual carbon reductions while also delivering needed relief to those communities that are lacking both economic and environmental justice. We mean by this that economic justice is about reducing the income and wealth gaps to create more opportunities for disadvantaged groups. It also means taking pains to avoid imposing the costs of climate solutions on lower income individuals and households. Environmental justice is really about ending the unfair concentration of unhealthy air and water pollution in poor and minority communities and implementing effective policies to mitigate the great harm caused by climate disruption to these communities. The growth of income inequality in the United States is really without parallel in the developed world. Today, the top tenth of Americans earn nearly half of all the income generated every year. And along with inequality comes serious poverty, experienced by all groups, but of course more severe among racial and ethnic minorities. As you can see from this chart, almost three times as many Hispanics live in poverty compared to white Americans. And poverty kills far more people than all the wars in history, more people than all the murders in history, more than all the suicides in history. Not only does structural violence kill more people than all the behavioral violence put together, it's also the main cause of behavioral violence. All of these economic inequities are matters in life and death. And pollution, mostly from fossil fuels and industrial processes, is a big killer too. Air pollution causes nearly 250,000 premature deaths per year in the United States. Now, as Tim mentioned, President Biden has accomplished a lot in the past few months with this pen. He set the tone for serious conversations and actions on the crisis. He even announced at his Earth Day summit with world leaders that the U.S. was back as a world leader on climate. But how can he back that up when the U.S. is one of only two developed economies that has not put a price on carbon? And what he says to world leaders means very little if his words aren't backed up by congressional action. They must enact in a solution that is robust enough in scope to make a significant difference. Now, a good climate solution, solution would drive large-scale change quickly, and it has to be big enough to match the scale of the problem. It must be able to withstand legal challenges so it can be working to reduce carbon emissions as soon as it becomes law. It has to be fair and provide relief for frontline communities who are suffering right now. And it must be durable. It will need popular support so that a change in political leadership won't easily overturn an effective climate policy. And it must be healthy for the planet and the economy. It should not only reduce carbon emissions for a healthy climate, but also help create jobs and a robust economy for all. So what approach meets this criteria? Well, it's called a carbon fee and dividend solution. This legislation has potential to dramatically affect the amount of carbon the U.S. pumps into the atmosphere. It was reintroduced in Congress a few months ago as the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. It now has over 70 co-sponsors, including your representative, Mr. Cardenas, uh, as an original co-sponsor of this bill. This bill has the potential to be a bridge across the partisan divide in our Congress because the relief from climate change will have benefits for both red and blue states. A fee on carbon will drive down America's carbon pollution and it will start to bring climate change under control while unleashing our American technological innovation and ingenuity. The carbon dividend will put money in directly into people's pockets every month to spend as they see fit, helping low and middle income Americans. The dividend becomes an economic stimulus. It will be a guaranteed income stream, helping those on the lowest tiers of the economy most of all. The more each household reduces its use of carbon, the, more, the less carbon will end up in our atmosphere and the more of the dividend is yours to spend as you wish. If the bill is enacted as written, this chart, which was prepared by some of the economists working on the project, shows us how it benefits all of you living in this congressional district. These figures are millions of dollars. So if you look at that column just to the right of center where it says 
uh, estimated net benefits, your district would receive $1.4 billion in dividends in the first 10 years of this policy. And at the same time, we'd be reducing everyone's health risk from the continued use and extraction from fossil fuels. And we actually have real world experience to support the benefits of a carbon tax. Since 1990, when Sweden imposed a carbon tax, the country's GDP has grown 80% while slashing CO2 emissions by 25%. That's if you follow that blue line. Uh, more strikingly, Sweden emits only a quarter as much CO2 per dollar of their GDP as we do in the United States. And this is mostly due to their fuel and carbon taxes. You know, trying to curb emissions through regulation can be effective, but re regulations also end up being costly. Businesses will pass on the increased costs of their compliance to us as customers, which drives up the cost for the goods and services we need. A carbon tax is a much less expensive way to accomplish the same goal. Increased costs are still passed on to us as customers, but we're also going to receive a regular dividend to offset the cost increases. For example, to reduce the same amount of carbon emissions that would be achieved by a $45 per tax ton on carbon would cost consumers $270 a ton through the use of regulations. So how does it work? Well, it puts a fee on each ton of carbon as it is extracted at the wellhead, the mine, or any extraction source, and also at the port of entry for any carbon products that are imported. The fee is collected by the federal government from the producers and then returned with, with uh, minor um, administrative costs to every individual household equally distributed, full shares for each adult, half shares for children, up to 18, two per household. You know, this law really meets our criteria for large-scale change through incentives that are fair to produce a healthier planet. It's effective. It's good for people. The policy is going to improve our health, save lives by reducing pollutions that we all breathe. Um, additionally, the carbon dividend is putting money directly into our pockets every month, which really means that the studies have shown that over two-thirds of the American public will be getting more in a dividend than the increased costs the tax will put on our energy. It also could be a bipartisan policy if um, we could get the other party off of um, that BS mountain they live on. Um, and it's um, this is a revenue neutral policy. It doesn't cost the government anything. We, the tax is collected and it's distributed. Now, Janet Yellen, who's serving as our Secretary of the Treasury, and nearly 3,600 economists, including 27 Nobel laureates, have signed a statement declaring that a steadily rising tax on fossil fuels is the most cost-effective lever to reduce carbon emissions at the scale and speed that's necessary. And they also support this with an equal dividend. So now I just want to share with you some screen grabs from an interactive climate solution simulator tool <clears throat> that was developed by MIT and a group called Enroads. This helps us evaluate our carbon emissions choices. I can't go live with this in our Zoom session here, uh, but I'm going to do my best to demonstrate how it works uh, with a couple of screen grabs. This tool is live on the internet, and you can play with it yourself to see how you can see what, what it works on. Um, we're going to put a link into the, um, the chat after this um, presentation for you to play with it yourself. So this first grab we're looking at um, is the tool showing the current status of our greenhouse gas emissions and where they take us by 2100 without any mitigation. The graph on the top left shows us the current mix of greenhouse gas sources that are currently going into our atmosphere. There's a color-coded legend underneath and it uh, helps us identify the various sources. Now the graph on the right just shows the black and a blue line which indicates the trajectory of where we're heading through the year 2100. Now this blue line is going to shift <clears throat> as we adjust the sliders on the bottom of this model. The sliders underneath the graphs are the various solutions available. The projected carbon increases in the atmosphere indicate that the parts per million of greenhouse gases will increase to over 1,200 parts per million by 2100. And if you remember the uh, thermometer that Tim showed us, that puts us about uh, three times higher than the two degrees Celsius. Um, 
threshold that we are not supposed to go over. Now in this screen grab, we've only altered one of those source sliders. You can see the carbon price blue line there where we've done just this one change and it drops the greenhouse gas parts per million down over 200 parts per million. And you can see the effect on that on the right side graph. It is the single biggest change option that's available to us. So it really should be implemented. Now, if we combine that one solution with a serious reduction in deforestation, a concerted effort at tree planting, afforestation on this chart, uh, reduction in methane leaks from our existing fossil fuel infrastructure, and we increase the energy efficiency in our buildings, we change our transportation sector to be more electrified with renewable energy, we can move that needle down below, uh, we can move the needle down below that 1.5 threshold. Um, we're not all the way there, but a carbon fee and dividend is still the best first step we can take. It alters the trend. It could be implemented quickly. It wouldn't be subject to delaying court challenges like regulations and would quickly be adopted by other countries who, if they wanted to sell their goods in our market, they would have to have a similar tax or we would be slapping a tariff on them. You know, we're going to address the climate crisis one way or another. We really have three options. There's mitigation, there's adaptation, and what's left if we don't do those is suffering. And it's really up to us to determine the mix. Or as my mother used to say when telling me to put some vegetables on my dinner plate, if you don't make a choice, one's gonna get made for you. We're here speaking to you tonight because the science says we're running out of time to change the course. Those hundreds of millions of dollars that the fossil fuel corporations have spent has brought them a lot of silence and apathy, confusion. 30 years of them earning all those obscene profits while their money gave them the power to keep our politicians from addressing the crisis and our newspapers and TV networks from connecting the dots that link catastrophic weather events to the growing climate emergency. We really have been distracted and confused long enough and we are out of time. We, the people, have the power to affect the changes we need, but we must be unified and use the levers of power that are available to us. It's time for Congress to step up and pass legislation. You can reach out and we can thank Tony Cardenas, uh, who's one of the original co-sponsors of this legislation and also his office uh, for all their efforts. And you can reach out to both of our U.S. senators and ask them to introduce similar legislation in the Senate. It's important for you citizens to reach out, uh, use your voice and let your representatives know that you do expect them to do something about the crisis and express your gratitude to them when they are sticking their neck out to take this action, which is not really popular yet. The more constituents they hear from, the harder they're gonna work to see this legislation become law and maybe it will be in time to actually save a lot of suffering. You can urge your friends and family in whatever districts or states they reside and ask them to support carbon pricing. You can also join our volunteers with the Citizens Climate Lobby or Climate Reality Project who are generating thousands of phone calls, media articles, letters to the editor, demanding we place a fee on carbon this year in this Congress. Um, I invite you to visit the Citizen Climate Lobby website to access materials and information to help you in your efforts to show support for carbon fee and dividend legislation. And we also have a survey form that uh, Andrea will make available to you and we'd like to hear um, what you think uh, of this presentation. So I want you to join those who are using their voices, casting their votes, and using their choices in the marketplace to fight for the future. Use your voice, use your vote, use your choices. Speak truth to power like your world depends on it. Because actually, your world does depend on it. And I thank you very much for your time and interest in this. Thank you, Tim and David, for that lovely presentation and really giving us the larger scope of, of this issue. Um, I didn't, I definitely didn't know all of that and all those statistics. So y'all really broke it down. Um, 
But I, I want to introduce Andres Ramirez, who is from Pacoima Beautiful. And we had reached out to Pacoima Beautiful because this organization is actually the one doing a lot of work here in the uh, Northeast San Fernando Valley and um, with youth and adults, the community in general. So I'll let Andres talk. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us, Andrea. And I want to thank also Tia Chuchas for inviting us and, and thank my colleagues, Tim and, and David, for such important information. And of course, Congressman Cardenas, who's been an ally for us for many, many years. And, you know, we just want to talk about, you know, how all this conversation about climate change impacts us here locally in, in the Northeast San Fernando, San Fernando Valley. Um, give me a second, I'll share my screen. So just to introduce myself, my name is Andres Ramirez. I'm policy director for Pacoma Beautiful. Um, Pacoma Beautiful is an environmental justice organization that's based here in the Northeast San Fernando Valley. We've been around since 1996. Um, our mission is to provide, um, provide education, impact public policy, as well as support local arts and culture in order to promote a healthy and sustainable San Fernando Valley. Now, of course, how we approach that work is 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 part of the is part of the the chief step, right? The the challenge. Um, you know, we live in a community, um, the Northeast San Fernando Valley, um, that has been designated one of the most highest impacted by the, the built environment, right? The state of California created a measuring tool called the Cali Viral Screen, which identifies several factors like air quality, health impact, um, proximity to toxic facilities. And through it, they're able, you're able to identify the communities that are most impacted by, by the climate, right? And our community is in the top 95 to 100 percent of most disadvantaged communities. That means because of, of, of all the things that were the, the built environment that, that, that impacts our community, we're the most impacted, right? We, we carry the burden, the health burden, the economic burden, the, the, the um, mental burden of, of climate change, fossil fuel usage. Um, and we live it on a daily basis. Um, our community is surrounded by toxic facilities. Um, you know, we have the Valley Generating Station, which which burns natural gas um, right in the middle of our community. We also have White Man Airport, a, a domestic airport that you know has few jet fueling and and oil recycling facilities on on the site. You know, have constant a, a constant um you know journey of of many airplanes. That are, that are spewing exhaust, right, from their jet fuel. There's also the Burbank Airport, there's also the landfills, and of course the freeways, right, the 210, the 118, the 170 and the, and the 5, right? These are all facilities that are in our community that are constantly, constantly impacting us on a daily basis. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the measures that we have to take, you know, as, as a community locally here, and what's what's called frontline communities, right? Frontline because we're literally on the front lines of these toxic, these toxic facilities, is pushing for a, a shift from fossil fuels, right? And and I'm glad that that we're able to think about the, the global impact, but the impact for us is really locally, right? When we're talking about you know extreme heat, um, extreme heat, we live it here in the valley every summer, right? Heat that get high as 110, 120 degrees. And the most impacted, of course, are our elders or, or, or the young ones, right? You know, a lot of people in our community don't don't have access to things like air conditioning or or you know spaces that that, that can help them beat the weather, right? And it's a constant worry for our community. Um, and that's why it's important as 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 we're talking about solutions, let's talk about how we, we make solutions here locally, right? Um, Definitely the sh a shift to clean energy generation and storage is an important part of it, right? Fossil fuel usage in the city of Los Angeles has been concentrated in communities like the Northeast Valley. Like I mentioned earlier, we have a gas plant in our community that was um, releasing methane for over, over two years without communicating to, our, uh, to, to the neighborhood of what's going on. We heard about the impact of, of methane in this presentation earlier, right? Of how much it, it impacts you know, the environment, the, 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 you know, the amount of, of heat that comes into our communities. And we lived in it here, right? Um, you know, our community does, do not, does not get the same respect, the same dignity that more affluent communities are, are, are often get, right? Because there was a similar situation that occurred in a community like Porter Ranch, a lot more affluent. They got a lot more attention. They got people evacuated. They got, you know, state giving people 
resources to, to, to address this issue, the same thing didn't happen in our community. And, you know, it goes to show, you know, when we're talking about environmental justice and, you know, this is more than just environmentalism, right? We're really talking about environmental racism. This, the city was planned in this way to put these, these facilities in our communities because it's poor working class people of color living here. Our lives are not being valued as, as, as much as others. Um, the shift from, from, from fossil fuels also creates an economic opportunity. One of the biggest challenges in our community is the, the cycle of poverty, right? And if there's gonna be a shift to clean energies, we wanna make sure that our communities are prioritizing that conversation. And if new jobs are gonna be created, that they start with, with the, the workforce that's available here in our community. There's, there's thousands of people in our community who are willing and able to work, they just need the opportunity to get these jobs, right? And I think it's, it's important that, we talk, that, that the conversation here locally, that's awesome. We always hear job creations are gonna be created, thousands of jobs are being created. But what we need to fight for is how, when is that hiring happening? How many of those jobs are coming to our neighborhood? Because that's going to be the, we're going to really see that shift, right? These industries that occur need, need to understand that the workforce that are going to create living wage jobs need to start in the communities that have been highest impact, you know? And then it's also a conversation about better land uses, right? Like when we talk about things like White Man Airport in our community, this airport does not really bring very many benefits to our community, right? Not many people in our neighborhood, in the community of Pacoima or Sun Valley or, or Stillmar own airplanes that, that they house at, at White Man Airport. And yet, at the same time, there's been 85 accidents that have occurred in that airport since 1970. Our community lives that trauma of fear and danger of airplanes flying, falling on top of us, right? On top of the, 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 the climate impact of emissions like i mentioned they fuel there they have oil recycling you know these airplanes are flying over our heads on a daily basis and those fumes are being breathed are, are, are being you know um inhaled by 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 our community and it's impacting our health um what what if that land was was used for something else right for example that airport what if we had a park there or what or, or what if you know there was an industry that could create jobs for people that's a better use right than something that's a recreational thing for people. And lastly, we deserve to live in a healthy community. One of the things that's become a beautiful as we've done this campaign, we're talking about White Man Airport and the Valley Generating Station. Opponents to, to these thoughts are always telling us if people don't like it, they could always just move out. And that's a real unfair assessment, right? A lot of folks in our community have generations here in the community. And to tell us that, you know, we, we're choosing, the, it's not the toxic facilities fault that we're getting poisoned, it's our fault because we choose to live here. It's really BS, right? You know, it's the toxic facilities that need to go. It's, it's people that need to be respected, you know, and we deserve to have a healthy community. It shouldn't, your, your you know, um, the death rate for you, for you shouldn't be equated to your zip code, right? And unfortunately, that's, that's what's happened, right? When we think about COVID and how hard our community has been impacted by COVID, there is a correlation that the fact that we live around these toxic facilities really made us more susceptible to this disease. You know, there is a, a bridge there, a connect there. There's a reason our, you know, our community is highly impacted. And, and we're saying enough is enough, right? Ya basta. There's no reason that we should be living like this. We, are, we deserve respect and dignity. And we can only take it by, by taking the measures ourselves. Oops, sorry. Um, when we're talking about solutions, it's really thinking about how do we bring those solutions here? And a lot of times that innovation has to come from us here in the community. Um, I, I, I applaud the, 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 the um, David's mention of, the, of carbon tax as, as something that's occurred. Here in the state of California, a carbon tax or a greenhouse gas reduction fund was created, right? That has generated, you know, resources to address, you know, um, climate change. Um, one of them being the Transformative Climate Communities Fund that was created. But Goma, in, in conjunction with several organizations like um, the Trust Public Land, um, Grid Alternatives, um, the Los Angeles Business Council, LA Conservation Court, to name a few, got together to create, to really give a proof of concept how we can really start shifting the impact of, of, of fossil fuels in a community like Pacoima and, and Sun Valley. We're, we're creating access to solar roof solar and rooftops in, in, in the community, right? How do we make it accessible for people? 
You know, we're also making a, 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 a workforce development in, in solar installation. We're teaching people in, in our community the skill sets in this industry that's growing. So they're prepared, they're prepared to join that, that workforce. We're bringing an electric dash bus fleet in, in, in our community for the first time, right? Having a dash, not only that it's, there's a dash, but it runs electric, it's not emitting into our community. We're also improving our tree canopy to help cool our streets. And we're also improving active transportation infrastructure because getting people off of cars is definitely a, a way to start impacting, you know, fossil fuel usage and, and air quality in our community. Um, another cool project that we did for this is the cool art mural in which we're utilizing the arts and, and the use of public arts, which is so important in our community, an important part of the, of the culture of our community um, as a way to combat climate change. Um, we're using heat resistant paint um, to help reduce the heat index. So just not using regular paint, but being conscious of what kind of paint we use. So when the sun hits a building, it cools it down. It is not creating more, more heat for our community. And definitely we, 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 we're modeling how to engage community around heat and climate change, right? And in this process of, of, of identifying an art project and putting it together and, 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 and making sure it got done and it just got finalized recently. Um, we're also looking at, at ways of how to transform blighted areas of our community into something that could be positive. This is an image of the Bradley, the Bradley Green Alley that recently got built by the San Fernando Gardens. It used to be just a regular alley ride that constantly flooded, that, that was not very well lit, um, that, that you know the community constantly used as, as the form of transportation and getting to and from um, you know, uh, Van Nuys Boulevard. Um, what we did is able to improve a public space by creating a space that can be used publicly, right? Benches, trees for shade. Um, and it's also a mixed use. Cars can still go, but, but it's, 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 it's definitely a slow down situation. You can't race through this place. Um, the trees are helping to lower temperatures during the hot summers by creating more shade for communities, like I said, that don't have regular access to ACs and things of that nature. And then, of course, the, op the, the issue of, of flooding um, by creating an aqueduct and, and infiltrating um, stormwater as a way to, to creating easier water access in our community, right? Um, ad addressing one of the bigger issues, flooding, which constantly occurs in, out here in the valley, right? Um, we've also launched the first electric car share program in, in, in the San Fernando Valley. Um, it's an app-based pro app program uh, that provides two electric cars available with with a solar, solar charging station at the same spot in the San Fernando Gardens. And what we wanna do is more than anything, you, we wanna normalize you know, electric vehicles. There, we don't see too many out in the neighborhood. There's not too many infrastructure for, for charging, but by bringing it, what we hope to do is be able to um, incentivize our, our leaders to continue to invest, to see that it could be successful. Where yes, we, we, we can have a car share program and yes, people use it, right? We launched it in 2020. People were using it to go get tested. Folks were using it to get vaccinated. Folks were using it to go to the doctor, to go to get, to get their groceries. You know, really thinking about ways that these programs can benefit the communities as they are, right? And not be seen and utilized as tools for a different community to come benefit in, in our neighborhood. You know, that's an important part for us. All these programs that we're proposing, they start from community up. The community's in, involved in, 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 in the planning and in, in overseeing implementation and, and ultimately evaluating all these programs. Because I think we want to make sure, we think that it's important that, you know, these programs model are modeled out in other frontline communities. So how best engage with the people most impacted by climate change. Um, and one of the things that, that we've learned through this process, right, um, Environmental justice does not happen in a silo. In our communities, it's it's really uh, uh, one of the issues that that intersects that impacts us as a whole, right? So when we're talking about equity, we're really talking about public health in our community, housing, transportation, land use, the to toxic environments, and jobs, right? All these things need to be occurring and, and thought about. And we really believe it's important that transformative solutions are not occurring in silos. And, and what we mean with that is we got to have these things in mind, right? You know, when we're talking about bringing investments, how are we thinking about, you know, impact on displacement? Because we don't want our community gentrified because we finally are dealing with, you know, climate change in our community, right? Or just a light rail that's coming into our community. How's that impact, you know, 
the businesses and, and, the, and, and the access for people. These are the questions we need to have in order to come, come up with viable solutions that are community led. Because at the end of the day, we've been fighting this fight for so long. We don't want to, we want to make sure that, that the victories are, are, are felt by the community that deserves it. Um, so that's, that's the end of, of my presentation. I definitely want to share our, our contact information. If folks want to, you know, contact us at Pacoma Beautiful. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Or you can definitely email us if you have any, any, any interest in supporting our work or you have questions on how we can support you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andres. That was a wonderful presentation as well. Wow, okay. Well, I know a bunch about climate change now. <laughs> And I can't say that I did before. Um, I think the general public knows that, um, I mean, I don't know, I can only speak for a few of us, right? Um, or a portion of our society that that we know the world is, is changing and that there's a crisis, um, but I think we know little about what to do because it's such a huge issue. Um, and it, it seems so daunting. So I'm curious to know, um, why did you decide to take up this work when when things seem so big? Sometimes we feel hopeless. So, so I'm curious if anyone wants to answer that question. Um, what brought you to this work? Sure, I I, I can go first on that. Um, for me, I mean, I, it's a love for the community, for you know, like a a, a desire to see justice and dignity served for our communities and understanding that, you know, things don't have to be this way, right? And, and there, we do have power to, to make a change. And, you know, we've seen it. We've seen it with, with constant battles that we've had, right? Like things like the Valley Generating Station, we're close to getting it shut down, right? Beforehand, it wasn't even a question whether we could. And, you know, I, I think understanding that, you know, this issue of climate change is real, the science is real, and we live it on the daily, right? And we're more highly impacted. And I think that's what motivates me to, to really continue being in this work and, and seeing it as a life mission, right? Because ultimately it's for, it's for future generations, right? We have to fix the mistakes that we and, and, and our ancestors have made and, and, and really think about, you know, what kind of planet we're living for, for, for the young ones, right? For the next generations, because, you know, if we don't take action, you know, things are gonna get worse before they get, you know, before they ever get better, right? And, and you know, we have a responsibility. And I, and I think the Congress hit it on point, right? Like, it's part of our, our nature to be stewards as opposed to, you know, dominators of, of, of this planet. Uh, and we really kind of get back in touch with, the, with, those, with those feelings. I, I can echo what Andrea said. I, I, what brings me here is the same thing that brought me into teaching. I, I remember when um, Navarro, Andre, you probably remember uh, Jose Navarro, when I first started at Silmar, he was my co-teacher, right? He was taught history, I taught English. And he was like, "What? why do you want to do this? And I said, well, I feel like my generation, what we've done to this planet is um, reprehensible it's unforgivable and the only thing that i can do as a member of my generation that i can do is try to pass on in that case education what i've learned you know how to teach critical thinking so people the 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 generation that follows me will be able to make critical decisions using data and logic and make the right decision and i think it's the same with the environment you know it, it there's no getting around who's responsible for the mess that we're in. There's no walking away from it. There's no avoiding it. And if we don't take that responsibility and our, it's our future generations, our grandchildren that are gonna suffer because of our short-sightedness, because of our selfishness. I can't live with that. I mean, I. And and I think we have to, you know, lead by example. That's why I decided to do it. You know, it's like put your money where your mouth is. You know, start, you can sit and talk about it so long with your friends at the dinner table, like, oh, climate sucks and we got to stop, you know, using fossil fuel. But that doesn't go anywhere. You have to put yourself on the line. And hopefully by 
making an example and making presentations will inspire people to do that. That's, I guess that answers your question. Um, I, I just would add to this that the reality for me is that we've known about this climate problem since, I've known about it since the late 1980s. And, and yet we have watched, you know, that curve of parts per million of greenhouse gases continue to go up. Well, the leaders of this country, in fact, the leaders of the world, aren't doing anything. And it's really up to us as a, a grassroots movement, as people on the ground experiencing these problems, to act and to show the leaders the way. I mean, not every congressional representative is as enlightened as Tony Cardenas. He, he's seen this and he's seen it firsthand from his youth and in the Pacoima um, uh, community. And, you know, he's responsible for it. There's a lot of politicians that, you know, they, I don't know what their reasons are for being in government, but they're supposed to be um, trying to make our country a better place. That's That was the the government studies that I learned in high school. And, um, you know, being a, a teenager through the Vietnam War, we really thought that the movement to try and stop that war, it took a while, but it had some effect and it got stopped. And, um, yeah, we need, we need to, sh you know, change doesn't come from the top down. It really comes from the bottom up. And we are trying to instigate that change with these climate presentations and, you know, by our activism. And the more people who get active, uh, the better uh, our chances are of saving um, the civilization for the next generation. Well, thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, I, I'm really glad we had this conversation. Again, it's not, I, I don't feel like it's something that we talk about on the day-to-day -day basis. Maybe you do because this is your work. This is your life's work. So thank you for sharing and um, and thank you again to Congressman Tony Cardenas for being here and representing our community um, on the government level and pushing these important policies. Um, so yeah, does anyone have any closing statements? Um, inspiration quotes? <laughs> no, no, all right, I, well, I, thank I, you so I'm much. I'm just gonna say that I stand by what I put in my presentation. We're going to have to address climate change. There's mitigation, there's adaptation, and if we don't mitigate and adapt, we're all going to suffer. So I hope everybody can take some action, small or light. Write a letter to your newspaper, talk to your friends. You know, we're very lucky that most of uh, Los Angeles County has Congress people who are enlightened about this and are doing something. But there's an awful lot of congressional districts around the country that um, don't have such enlightened leadership. And so talking to your family in other states, Texas, Arkansas, you know, take your pick. The word needs to get spread, you know, at the bottom. It's, it's, we, we can change this, but we all have to act. We can't just sit back and wait. I would definitely echo that, that sentiment, right? Of, of um, it's, it's up to us to, to really take action and, and any action is, is worth it, right? You know, whether it's, it's, it's talking to somebody about it, um, whether it's, you know, make sure you recycle or or, or think about a, a, an electric vehicle that's within your means or, you know, come out and support our work when we're talking about advocating for park space and green space or, or you know, shifting to clean energy because it's important. It, our voice needs to be heard as as a, as a community we do have power and influence over our elected officials because they're ultimately accountable to us and you know we must really take ownership of that power and and you know be, be empowered enough to to educate ourselves on what's going on and make sure that they're they're voicing our our, our needs and and their priorities i can leave with one quote that i usually have in the presentation that uh was something that Al Gore said it during the training, and I think it's it it gives me a little bit of hope. 
just for, about human beings in general. And he, was, he said there was an oil minister, a Saudi oil minister back in the 60s, who was addressing the, uh, an OPEC meeting, you know, all the oil ministers, all the oil magnates. And he said, remember, and this is when Saudi Arabia was screaming. I mean, you know, they were on top of the world. He said, remember, the Stone Age did not end because they ran out of stone. The oil age will not end because we run out of oil. It's, human beings are innovative and they continue to innovate and innovation is what's going to probably save our behinds because we're going to the innovations that are coming along now don't require oil and coal and gas and we're, we're building on that and we're we as a species are given to change we're we, we're very adaptable and we're always searching for new ways of doing things and that gives me a certain amount of hope Yes, so I would just like to echo that um, you can always participate with Pacoima Beautiful. They're always having events um, for the community, a lot of fun things that they do for the health of our community and the, the sustainability of it. And then uh, we are also putting the contact information for the Climate Reality Project and the, clim the Citizens Climate Lobby. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Tim, David, Andres, and then the Congressman office and Tony Cardenas. Thank you so much. And let's keep the conversation going and let's take action. Before you say goodbye, I just want to remind you to, that we gave you that poll, that if people can fill that in and give us some feedback and possibly get involved, we can help. You know, we, we want to, people have energy and concern. They don't know what to do. Um, we we want to help you be active. So thank and thank you again, Andrea, for leading this today and all the effort you put into putting tonight's event together. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, Andrea. Thank you. you did a great job. I know it was a lot, a lot of pressure.